Adam. Welcome to the second episode of Cleaning the Built World, hosted by myself, Nathan Ma, co-founder at Miro. Adam, it's been a pleasure getting to know you over the past few years. You know, we first connected, I think, many years ago, but we've more recently gotten back in touch. It's it's been Google and Rogers. Adam, if you don't mind, tell the audience a little bit about your role, the company that you work for, and uh, what brings you here today. Yeah, so great to see you again as well, Nathan. So currently, I operate as the senior manager for IoT at Rogers Communications. And I would say, you know, day by day, week by week, the role changes and augments a little bit, but I'd love to think of myself as the one that's sort of responsible for the sales, sales strategy. I work collaboratively with our marketing team, with our product team, with our sales enablement team, because it's really about, you know, first architecting a vision for what IoT could be and what it means to Rogers, and then implementing that vision through a variety of different sort of means. Yeah, I mentioned, you know, because we had been in touch a few years ago, even I think maybe back to 2019 now, mm-hmm. you know, you've been really in the space for, for some time and fast forward to 2022 and the industry has, has moved quite a long way from our perspective as a vendor in this industry. From your side on the tele- telco side, where have you seen IoT develop? Like where have the biggest developments been in the space, you know, just over the past few years? Yeah, I think there's a couple of different areas in which I've seen it sort of evolve and change. I think from a telco spec perspective, just generally speaking, at one point, probably eight, nine years ago, we viewed IoT more as a connectivity play that we would provide sort of the underlying technology that would power IoT solutions. But I don't necessarily believe that we saw ourselves as the enabler of specific business outcomes through the adoption, creation, deployment of different solutions. Over time, I think we've come to understand that there are very few industries, I would say, that are as well positioned as telco is to deliver on some of those specific outcomes, just because of the assets that we have as an organization. I mean, we've certainly learned a great deal, like as we've gone through that process in terms of where we can add the most value to our clients, where we should be competing. And and I would say probably most importantly, where we should not, where it makes sense to partner with organizations that are the leaders in that respective field like Mero to deliver some of those end outcomes for our clients. Got it. And I think that's a really good insight because like you said, the, the resources and the assets that, that come from the telcos, that is something that I think for the, the potential customers of, you know, say for us, building managers and building owners, they will re- definitely resonate with a, with a brand like Rogers and, uh, you know, brands like, like the others that you worked in the past. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of times when we talk to some potential customers, it's really their first interaction with potential IOT systems. And a lot of times we are the first technology for smart building technology in any of these buildings. And as a result, we're bringing in, you know, an IOT network. We're, we're standing that up and managing that network ourselves as a service. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, that first step for say your clients or, you know, potential owners of buildings and what it really takes for them to get, say, get from day zero to day one, really implementing that from the ground level. And what are some of the key challenges that some of your clients have had to face? Well, I'd say it varies somewhat across industry, but the most effective deployments that I've seen, regardless of the technology or the end solution that we landed on, was first understanding the problem that you're looking to solve. And is that, in fact, the problem that you're looking to solve? Like we find that across our customers, as they're going through digital transformation, I think initially there was a perspective that, you know, you could just ingest or procure a number of different technologies and that fundamentally help you to be, or enable like a digital transformation. And that's not necessarily the case. I think it's different, you know, not just at a vertical level, but certainly from a customer level, like what is it fundamentally that you're hoping to achieve? So when we're engaging with our clients, we typically focus on sort of four key areas that we believe that all strategies are aligned to. So we focus primarily on customer experience. So how do you leverage technology in a way that delivers an exceptional customer experience. And can you use that? And how do you use that as a differentiator within your market? I would say secondarily to that is probably around the area of operational efficiency. And there's numerous reasons for that. It's not always associated with a direct cost. I think particularly over the last 
year or two, we've seen an increased focus around sustainability and sustainability initiatives that have a natural financial benefit that's associated with them. But I think that there's a concerted effort to focus more on the adoption of smart technologies to drive some of those specific outcomes, recognizing that we are part of or in the midst of a climate crisis. I would say probably third from my perspective, we're looking at leveraging technology as a, as a tool to help manage risk and risk means different things across different businesses. But if I was to look at IOT in the way that I approach it within the context of my role, and frankly, just to, I think that all businesses are trying or striving to become data-driven organizations. So why does that matter? What does that actually mean to a, a, an individual customer? Like, how does that help you transition from that day zero to day one? I think first and foremost, there's no better opportunity than IOT to provide that visibility and that insight. So, you know, as a telco, obviously we have the ability to collect that data and ingest that data on behalf of our clients. Where we add particular value is through partnerships such as ours with the ability to take that data understand that data, what it means in the context of that business, apply some degree of insight and based on that data-driven decision modeling, it gives you the ability to make decisions that are based in fact, not just based on anecdotal evidence. And oftentimes as you collect more data, as you derive more insights, it helps you to understand correlations that perhaps would not have been, you know, visible under the naked eye. And then I think finally, like from a fourth perspective, it's really focused around employee engagement. So I think that there's a changing expectation. Certainly I see it within a large company like Rogers and some of my uh, previous stops, but how do we provide a better experience to our employees internally? And how do we make tools available to them that allow them to be more productive or allow us to allocate real estate space effectively so that they have the tools and and so on necessary to be successful and feel satisfied in the work. So I would say those are the four key areas that we tend to focus on, but more importantly than anything else, the one thing that I've learned over time is it's never about the technology. It's never about the individual solution because that's a dangerous road to go down. There are, I equate it to, there are multiple doors into the same room. There's a lot of different ways that we can solve a particular problem with different sort of technology or, or what have you, but first it's, it's a key importance to focus on what is the problem that we're actually looking to solve? What is the outcome that we're hoping to try? And then let's understand how can we leverage technology in a way that benefits just not that problem, but can be applied holistically across the organization to help us transform. And as that process, as I said, it's a, it's a roadmap, it's a journey that you're on. So establish those meaningful steps to help you get there, you know, with a variety of partners, frankly. Yeah, that, that's a really good insight. And I really like the approach of having kind of the four pillars of value because none of those pillars really stood out to me as, as being obviously more or, or critical to any particular business than another. Each of them for individual organizations may, may be a, a priority at any given time. And I think that kind of leads back into your next point where you're talking about, yeah, the technology is not as important as what issue or what problem are you trying to solve as, as a business. So from, in saying all that, from your perspective, um, with all of the technologies out there and kind of the, you know, in creating that roadmap, what sort of things, if you were putting yourselves in the shoes of a, of a client, what sort of things would you really want to start with first. I think a lot of, we've seen organizations, for example, roll out, you know, what we're calling kind of colloquially, like the single pane of glass, you know, they're trying to put in the foundation before, you know, kind of putting in each individual vertical or each individual vendor, one of which is Miro, or do you see it being more valuable to, you know, solve each use case and then um, have each of those vendors work with one another to create kind of more of an you know, integrated system. I think we can all agree, obviously, that interoperability is going to be a really key part of IoT into the future, but uh, sort of that roadmap towards how that's being done, that's, I think, still up in the air. So if you don't mind, maybe just commenting a little bit about, you know, if you were on the client side, or if, you know, if you're just consulting one of your clients, you know, what, what is really the, 
best way for them to start with their actual technical implementation of, of some of these technologies? Is it to start broad and then have everyone work into a common funnel or to start with, you know, your verticals and then have them work across one another? I think either approach is acceptable if you understand what the end goal is that you have in mind. I think, you know, and I hate the expression single pane of glass, but there's just a better way to, to actually define it. And I think that's the real value. I spoke about it a little earlier, the idea of the correlations between different data sets and understanding the impact that one solution may have relative to behaviors of another that may be tracked. It's the opportunity for automation and efficiency through that, that I think is exciting. So I think as an end state, that's where you need to get to. There has to be some form of aggregation of that data, whether it's, you know, through a platform or yeah, honestly, there's a, there's numerous different ways to do it. And I think yeah. it varies by customer. As I said, like within the smart building segment, I think sometimes it's easier to dip your foot in the, in the pool of IOT. So start with something with a very clear mandate, a very clear problem that you're looking to solve. And I think the important thing is to understand when you're adopting that solution, is there an ancillary impact on other departments? So think about the ability for that solution to be scaled and, you know, evaluate it as you're going through the process, you know, is it delivering on like, what are the expected benefits that I should receive? Are they delivering against those expected benefits and what ancillary benefits hadn't I thought of that it's actually achieving now, but fundamentally it keeps coming back to what can I do with that data to drive automation, to drive a better experience, to help manage my risk. I think those are the key things for me. So either approach works. And I think it depends on the complexity of the business as well, right? Like when you talk about a grand vision for transformation, it's not something that happens in three months, six months, one year. So I think, I think it's important to do both. I think I've heard it referred to like being in the air and in the ground at the same time. So a large overarching transformation strategy that you're working towards, but recognize that it sometimes starts with, you know, small POCs or small deployments to fix a very specific problem. And then as you learn more, continue to scale, grow, aggregate that data and use that insight to drive better outcomes within the business. Yeah, the, the, that is a great point. And I think the, the last part, you know, there with, you know, really putting it back in, into the vendor's hands, allowing them to prove out the use case that, to that they're kind of promising. What we have really tried to focus on is very specific vertical, um, cases, you know, we're not trying to be a one size fits all solution. We're not trying to solve every problem. We solve a very specific problem when it comes to cleaning and hygiene in commercial buildings. That's a, that's a very well-known issue and, and we feel like something that, you know, we can, we can really scale also because of the, the size of this industry. But that kind of, you know, leads us to the point where, you know, maybe when we talk to say people in, um, you know, in, at the VP level or, or higher, you know, they're working in innovation, they, they don't actually really understand the level of detail that we go into when it comes to cleaning, you know, we. We're running cleaners around buildings and we're doing things like toilet tissues, paper towels, and, and these sorts of things. Um, so we get kind of a, a bit of a mixed reaction when we talk to the, the innovation folks. And sometimes we talk to um, more of the property folks and, and they love it, but you know, they get blocked because of IT or, or, or things like that. So you know, we, we kind of have this bit of a chicken or egg situation almost when talking to our, our potential customers in that. You know, we, we'd love to get this problem solved for us in the cleaning and hygiene space, but it requires a lot of very specific industry expertise in order to really, truly kind of fully understand that use case. So if you put yourself in, in some of the shoes of say those innovation directors or, or the people that you work with on a regular basis, how are they taking the time to understand some of these, you know, niche use cases that are happening within the buildings are happening within their sites in order to properly understand the value of the potential technologies that, that could go into those places. Well, yeah, I think in some cases it's part of our role to help connect the dots for those individuals to help them understand it. And it's a collaborative, it requires sort of collaboration between multiple departments who all have frankly different objectives. I think that's the idea in the single pane of glass is that delivers insight across 
multiple portfolios. And I think the larger the organization, the more silos that exist. And I mm -hmm. think, you know, people's natural association when they think about, you know, the smart washer is, you know, how will that drive innovation within my business? But when you think about it in terms of context with any public space that you're entering into, your reflections on that public space are oftentimes driven by the condition of the washroom, like whether it has the different consumables that you're looking for, like understanding the traffic, driving the efficiency through, you know, having the washroom service in a manner that makes most sense of the assets that you have in your control. So, you know, with some of the larger clients that we work with, you know, you understand the focus on delivering a fan experience. So it's not much different than any other sort of customer experience exercise. Focus on the biggest problem that exists within your space and solve it through the use of innovative technology and data. And I think that even from my perspective, I didn't realize the scale and the impact that your technology could have on some of our clients until we started speaking with them. Right. Yep. And it's just, it's visibility into something that they hadn't considered before, but it becomes one of those really powerful correlations that you can leverage, you know, to develop a better understanding of your customer, to develop a better understanding of the use of your footprint and deliver an exceptional experience. Um, yeah, I appreciate that. And, you know, I think that's a, a, a the aha moment, if we could kind of encapsulate that, you know, when you, when you discover again, how this, the scale of this is, you know, that's really what we, uh, that's really what we work for. And I think to proliferate that, that message is, is definitely something that we feel really empowered to do Sierra Bureau. So that's, that's something that it's a great comment and I appreciate that. The, the next thing I'd, I'd love to kind of take the lens of a, of a vendor here. So, you know, for example, a company like Miro or even some, another smart building vendor. One of the issues with startups in general is, you know, our time horizons are in months, not even necessarily years. Whereas in real estate and, and some of your clients, you know, those time horizons may even be decades. So how are all of these technologies kind of able to work on, you know, these you know, long time spans, like how can we really create lasting impacts with, with technology and how is real estate looking at kind of the longevity of some of these technologies? Because I think that's something that's come up for, for us recently is, you know, quite simply, you know, are these companies going to be around in a year and two years and three years, they want to really test the longevity of it. How big of uh, an impact does, you know, brand and, you know, kind of that identity of a, of a startup or even of a tech company matter and, you know, what can tech companies do in order to kind of maybe work against that or, or, or start to show that they're, you know, here for the long run, not just for a couple of months. Well, yeah, I think partnership and sort of the support of larger organizations obviously helps that like a company like Rogers, but I don't think we're unique in that respect. I think what you're finding out, particularly in the building space is, you know, large companies have certain advantages, obviously from a capital perspective, from a brand perspective and so on, but at times they're not nearly as nimble or as focused as, as a startup would be just by, by design and by necessity, frankly. So what I've seen as a trend really over the last three years is the increasing involvement of larger organizations such as Rogers within that innovation and accelerator sort of community to have a lens on what the next sort of evolution of smart technology will be and looking at it in terms of how could that augment our existing ecosystem and then how could we support them as internal clients as well. So, you know, there's. Dream Unlimited, as an example, is a very large corporation that had an entire ventures arm that's devoted to understanding what technologies across the landscape and how they could incorporate that technology into future builds to drive some of their goals from a sustainability perspective, from an efficiency perspective, from a customer experience perspective. And I think, you know, the future will be written by creators and founders such as yourself that are looking at the problems that exist in the current you know, ecosystem in the current world and then solving them using innovative techniques. And I think as you proliferate, as you establish some of those beachhead clients, which you've done like over the past number of years, 
I think word of mouth is incredibly powerful. Like all of our end clients, whether they're Rogers clients or Bureau clients, their primary focus and their primary understanding is on their own individual businesses. So they certainly understand that entire ecosystem or that environment particularly well. And they look for thought leadership from individuals such as ourselves that can provide them some insight on the technology itself. And where does this fit in within my plan? I think frankly, like where we fall down at times is once again, by focusing on the technology and not aligning it to the specific goals and outcomes that our customers are looking for. That's a, that's a great insight. And I think, and truly understated the, the value that, you know, say like a, a certain independent third party, like Rogers with a really very reputable brand, but also just, you know, very well networked individuals that are part of the team there. I think that's, that's something that a lot of, you know, say people on the fence would be well suited to, to consult and to talk to. I think the, the one thing that we can probably both agree on is, you know, I think the, the worst thing that our mutual clients can really do right now is, is be inactive. You know, I think there, there's rarely been situations or instances in, you know, the macro environment where, you know, there's been a, a such a huge shift as what happened in 2020. But I think now, you know, we've seen it in other industries, how technology is, has become such a force in creating value, but also just making an impact on our lives where, you know, I think looking to 2022 and beyond, we really can't see a future without this technology being, being commonplace and, and being something that is just impacting all of our lives, whether or not that's five years, two years, even or longer, I think the eventual inevitability of it is, is really going to be there in the, in the long run. And, you know, for us, we, we, we hope to be a part of that future. Um, absolutely. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's awful, obviously, you know, what we had to go through from a pandemic, but I think it also increased the urgency and acceleration of most organizations, digital transformation plans, because in an instant you had to think about, you know, remote collaboration in an instant, you had to think about, you know, proper sanitizing and hygiene and how you effectively manage those buildings or having your existing business model completely disrupted. Like particularly within the sort of smaller mid market, low end of the commercial space, there were tons of organizations that were looking at, you know, providing e-commerce type services or an omni-channel experience that you allow customers to do business with them wherever they were at whatever time they wanted to engage. But I think, you know, when the option for that sort of brick and mortar experience didn't exist, it put a lot of businesses in a very tough spot. So I think there were valuable lessons that were learned, you know, from all organizations ranging from, you know, the, the startup with one or two employees right up to a company like Rogers. Yep. Yeah. And, and what we learned during that time is, you know, we, we learned really the, the, I think adaptability of certain organizations. You know, we can think of one of our big, now large customers where, you know, they started with a very core use case with, you know, this low occupancy in, in their buildings and that, you know, they were using our devices, our sensors in order to monitor the occupancy to, to both, you know, kind of reduce some of their upfront costs, but also longer terms for things like leasing and, and assets and whatnot. So I think that that's one example of, you know, how an organization was able to use a, you know, fairly un, um, unprecedented circumstance kind of for, for the better. And now they kind of built that muscle for the long term to know how to implement data, know how to use information that, you know, they might not have even looked for before. So for lack of anything else, this big shock to the system, you could say has, you know, created a, a sort of a new way of, of doing things that at least, you know, we're, we're at least putting some more attention into some of these new practices. So I think that's, that's, that's really, really great. I guess my question to you would be, you know, what, what examples have you seen out there of, of some of your customers or some of your clients being very adaptable or, or, you know, whether it was in 2020 or, or any other times and you know, kind of any unique implementations of, of technology that you feel is something that was worth sharing. Oh, there, there's, there's so many that come to mind immediately. Like when you were talking about the occupancy sensors and like ultimately using the technology as a, as a different, in a different way than initially intended. I mean, that's striking for me because I think of the insight that can be gathered that if you're a developer, if you're a builder, 
if you're someone with an, an existing network of properties, and in many cases, the amenities can be a differentiator, a specific part of the value prop that's associated with them. Some of the clients that we work with have premier properties with things like home theaters and golf simulators and, you know, exceptional commons and so on. So understanding the utilization of spaces like that to help inform future decision-making, I think can be a really powerful tool from, a from a transformation perspective, some of the, I, as I said, I believe we're at the inflection point when all businesses are understanding the need and being data driven, but I think for many, they don't know exactly what that means and exactly what they're going to do with the data and how they're going to lead it and so on. But I've seen some really innovative use of, you know, aggregation platforms that are ingesting virtual, like virtually unlimited data sets, providing some correlations between delivering workflows specifically that are tied to those correlations and then using digital twin technology mm -hmm. as a means to like sort of run those simulations, run them some of those different variables to understand different outcomes that would be delivered based on, you know, the different parameters that you put into place. So I've seen it happening across construction specifically in that space, like an industry that has been typically slow to innovate, slower certainly than some others. I would say construction is on the forefront of digital transformation at this point and innovation specifically because the opportunity is greater there as opposed to anywhere else. I think from a building perspective and from our perspective, the use, like the increasing use of digital concierges to unlock and provide like an exceptional type of tenant experience has been, it's been really powerful to see. I mean, I think at one point we thought of amenities just as, you know, nice to have across the different buildings, but, you know, solutions like yours and like some of the others within our ecosystem are now giving a degree of insight uh, around like the utilization of those different, those different sort of amenities that we talked about and for the insight on the utilization of the building themselves. I think it's, it's really about building that database of data and using that as a tool to inform future decision-making. Right. Yeah. And I think uh, just to touch on, on the first point, yeah, I, th I feel like knowing that if, if you're a sports fan, there's, for example, teams that will use analytics and they'll use data to influence their decisions, but there's always that component. I, I suppose, of, of, you know, say the traditional method of, you know, say if, if you're evaluating talent or evaluating players, you know, the eye test versus analytics, how much you value each of those is kind of up to the individual organization. But the, the reality is, is that there, there needs to be a component of, of analytics to, to really impact that. And, you know, I think specific industries moving along on that pace is, is a good metaphor to kind of connect to that. I'd, I'd like to shift a little bit into kind of security and managing, you know, the uh, security of, of all of these networks in our buildings. I'm sure this is a topic that comes up for you quite frequently, quite often. As it should, I might add, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, I'd love to open up, you know, kind of that, that topic to you. What are some of the most important things to consider when it comes to security and privacy, you know, when implementing some of the, these IoT systems? I think from, from strictly a connectivity period, I mean, the technology itself that can ensure privacy and ensure the integrity of your connection, some of it has existed forever, but I think it was viewed at one point in time as a, as a nice to have, not necessarily a need to have. So as more devices come on the network and various different endpoints in the absence of any sort of form of management, it exposes vulnerability. So I'll use the example like of a private APN. So for those that aren't sort of familiar with network technology, I will keep it as simple as possible. And not only because I don't understand it that deeply, but I understand <laughs> it enough to, be, to, enough to be dangerous, but I'll use the example of an endpoint. So any of these smart technologies oftentimes will use a modem of some type, a controller that will then communicate to the cloud to either provide a dashboard, provide insight, or trigger actions, and so on. So at one point in time, like particularly as modems or hardware devices are out in field, in the absence of active patching, which does not happen all the time, or new vulnerabilities that are uncovered, there's risk in those connections, those now connections and being compromised. And I think the result of that can be catastrophic, whether it's a, a DDoS or distributed denial of service attack, 
platform, whether it's used to compromise, like it's used as a gateway into the network itself, but obviously catastrophic results. So there are very basic things that you can do. So like, as I, I said at the start, like a private APN. So fundamentally what it does, and there's a few different flavors, but think of it this way. It's connect, it's creating a secure tunnel between that endpoint, whatever it happens to be back to whatever core infrastructure you want. So a server environment, cloud instance, whatever the case is, the key thing is that it doesn't exist over the, over the open internet. So 10 years ago, when people were deploying sort of connected devices, it, it was predominantly the go-to market way that most people did it was using like a public static IP address. And there's, there's obviously danger in that. So if it's sitting within a public network, then it's visible for anyone to see. At least in a dynamic environment, it's changing all the time. But if it doesn't move, then that's what introduces risk. And the easiest way that I could explain it to a potential customer, frankly, I use this analogy from time to time. Think about driving through an individual neighborhood and it's full of detached homes. And as you're driving through, that's your public network. You're on a public road and you can see all of the addresses and you can see the front door and let's just assume they're unlocked because that's functionally what you're doing with a public static IP connection and someone can walk in. So utilizing something like control center, obviously it's private IP that's primarily deployed across there. And the difference between that would be to think for some of your building clients in terms of like a condo development that they're doing. So you may understand the general address where they're trying to go, but you don't necessarily understand the suite that they're trying to get. So if someone can't find you, they can't compromise. So that's the initial benefit of private IP. When you add in an additional layer of security, like a private APN as an example, and facilitate that direct connection, it can't be found. And if it can't be found, it can't be compromised. It never travels over the open internet. It's a direct connection between that endpoint device. And as I said, whatever core infrastructure you want it to be. So I think that for anyone deploying an IOT solution, it's part of, it should be part of their due diligence process to understand privacy and how those secure connections are being made. Obviously, you know, we have a very rigorous process at Rogers from a security and privacy perspective that we evaluate all of the potential partners against before deploying them as full solutions. It's very intensive because of that, because of the impact that it could have on our customers and you know, obviously because of, of our brand as well, we have the tools and technology available to secure those connections. So, you know, to our partners, we can provide that guidance and that leadership. And for anyone within the community looking to build their own solution, I think it's important that it become, you know, part of their posture as well. So speak to qualified individuals within this space that can help you with that. That would be. Yeah. And I, I I think that, that I think that really sound uh, like even interesting because I feel yeah, like no, <laughs> I think, I think you, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, I think, you know, having that level of sort of understanding and, and sort of, you know, intent over such a critical area of, you know, what impacts us all, you know, un uncovering, I guess, the black box of, of security for a lot of folks, I think is, is really, really important because, you know, it's like, like you said, it's, it's something that everyone yeah. needs to be aware of, but I think not a lot of people are. And I think, you know, your, your explanation of it really just highlighted something for me, which is that for those that again, are, are kind of looking to get started on, on an IT journey and really get, get implemented, there's no real better place to go than to their trusted kind of vendors and, and, you know, kind of the, the most trusted kind of brands that we're interested. So, you know, I think that, that really summarizes things very, very succinctly in that, you know, I think using and really leaning on Rogers and leaning on some of these other very um, well-versed kind of call them, you know, third parties or consultants on getting started with different vendors, I think is, is really the first step towards getting started into this industry and, uh, you know, kind of realizing some of the benefits and the value. With that, Adam, you've been really generous with your time. I'll give you one uh, kind of last chance if there's any sort of last comments or closing questions or things you'd like to mention, please feel free. Yeah, no, it, it's been a pleasure. I honest, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today and to speak to your audience around sort of this, this industry and what's happening. I think it, it's constantly evolving. So as much as I may be perceived as an expert in this space, having spent a significant amount of time, I can assure you that I learn something new virtually every day, you know, through partners such as yourself. 
through other thought leaders in this space. So I would say if I have any advice for any clients is be open and understanding, like first articulate what your goal is, what it is that you're hoping to achieve and be as upfront and open as possible with potential vendors that you're talking to, to help them understand your goals. Like look for partners, look for people that deliver value and provide some, some degree of leadership in that space. But as I said, be open with what it is that you're hoping to achieve. And I think by doing that, you'll quickly understand who are the right partners to work with, to help you achieve your vision, typically by the time that it gets to IT. So yeah, this is really directed at senior leaders within the business. By the time it gets to IT in many cases, then you've already predefined, you know, the solution that you want to put in place because you believe it may be the, the West would, the best way to sort it. So engage early in the process with some of those trusted vendors to understand, you know, what's possible. That's, that's awesome. Yeah, Adam, again, thank you so much for your time. We, we appreciate you sharing your story, your, your expertise and some of your background Rogers and giving some of that advice to, to any potential clients. So yeah, we appreciate everyone. Thank you for listening and we'll talk to you next time.